Hello, and welcome to I Know Dino, the, the Big, Big Dinosaur, Dinosaur Podcast, Podcast, where we cover news, interviews, and discussions of all things dinosaur. Hello, and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today we'll be talking about Pachyrhinosaurus. We have an interview with Christopher Lohman and some dinosaur news. Before we get into the news, just a quick reminder, we've launched our Patreon page at www.patreon.com slash I know dino and Patreon is spelled P-A-T-R-E-O-N and there you can show your support by giving a monthly pledge to our show and it really helps us a lot to pay for our equipment and our hosting and all these types of things and there's a whole list of rewards on the site that you get for donating at different levels you can select different things so if you're interested go to patreon.com slash I know dino and Thanks to everyone who's been supporting us so far. Yeah, big thank you. And for those who are just curious, there's a quick two-minute video we made, too, that talks about what we do and some of the dinosaurs that we cover. So first in the news, an article published in the journal Acta Paleontologica Polonica titled A New Arctic Hadrosaurid from the Prince Creek Formation of Northern Alaska from paleontologists Maury Druckenmiller and Erickson, and in it they describe this new species of hadrosaurid that was found in northern Alaska. At least that's what it is these days. So we've talked a lot about hadrosaurs in the past, and they're typically described as like duck-billed dinosaurs, and you can think of ducky from Land Before Time. They're one of the most common dinosaurs. We've talked about Hattie the Hadrosaur that's in New Jersey, specifically Haddonfield, New Jersey, if there weren't enough hads there. And that was one of the earliest mounted dinosaur specimens. And the reason it was discovered and mounted so early in our understanding of dinosaurs is because there are so many hadrosaurs that seem to be fossilized. So they're pretty common, but as you might guess, Alaska is a cold place. And it seems to have been pretty cold even way back in the dinosaur era, or at least relatively cold. So you never know exactly what kind of dinosaurs you're going to find around there. The area they were digging in was about 69 million years old. And as the title mentioned, it's called the Prince Creek Formation. And specifically, these fossils came from a bone bed called the Liscombe Bone Bed, named after geologist Robert Liscombe who discovered it way back in 1961 when he was drilling for oil, actually. So they've been looking in this area for dinosaurs for at least that long, and most of what they've found has been hadrosaurs. But it was difficult for them to identify what they were because it was just a smattering of bones, and most of them were juveniles. So it's always more difficult with juveniles because it's hard to identify what size they would have been as full-grown adults. And sometimes bones change shape a little bit as they age, and so it's harder to work with juvenile bones, apparently. In this paper, the researchers brought together all of those bones, and they used a couple fancy analyses to try to compare the different bones and try to figure out if they could identify the new species or if it even was a new species. So it looks like what they ended up with was a known species of Edmontosaurus, and Edmontosaurus is a pretty large hadrosaur not surprisingly from Canada, like Edmonton. So this is named Ugru Naluk, and that name means ancient grazer in Inupiaq, which is the local language. We talked a little bit about that before in the past, too. And the species name is, I believe, Kukpikensis. I'm not sure where exactly that species name comes from, though. The group is still continuing to work in that area because they think there's still more stuff to find, And they're really interested in this area of the ancient high Arctic because it is a little bit isolated. And since it was a slightly different climate, it can lead to more interesting dinosaurs, potentially. Ugrunaluk was probably about 30 feet long. And according to the researchers, it's likely that there are so many juveniles in the area because they were probably wiped out in a herd and thus taking out a similar-aged population to create that deposit. So we look forward to hearing if they find anything else in that bone bed. 
in the future. In other news, scientists have found two new dinosaur nesting sites in the Dar district in Madhya Pradesh, about 65 million years old. They think there are at least 15 fossils of dinosaur eggs at each site, and they will be doing a detailed study in the future. So far, dinosaur eggs found in that area, though, are sauropod eggs. We've mentioned this before, but in April and May of 2016, a team will drill 5,000 feet into the Peak Ring, atomic hills of low density, which scientists don't know how this formed, of the Chicxulub Crater in Mexico to learn more about the crater's impact and whether or not new life forms were triggered from it. Joanna Morgan, geophysicist from the Department of Earth Science and Engineering at Imperial College London, is co-leading, and she said by drilling above the peak ring, they can see how long it took life to recover. And they'll also be looking at the microbiology to see what formed there and what may possibly be able to form on Mars, since Mars may have had early life in oceans, but some catastrophic event wiped everything out. Computer simulations of the crater show the, quote, initial impact pushed the Earth 18 miles down in an area 60 miles wide. Mountain ranges the size of the Himalayas would have formed in two minutes flat, end quote. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. If you are trying to imagine a peak ring, the easiest thing to do is Google it. But if you want to just imagine it in your head, it's a bump that's formed in the middle of a crater after a big impact. And the way I imagine it is if you see one of those really close-up pictures of a water drop hitting a lake and then kind of splashing back up a little bit in the middle, it's that exact same shape. It's the kind of rebounding. So as Sabrina's saying, if it pushed down 18 miles, then it kind of bounced back up in the middle and left a little bump there that can be tested. It sticks up farther from the ocean floor than the rest of the crater. In a couple episodes, we're going to be talking about the American Museum of Natural History and there's a new permanent exhibit that's about to be installed there. And specifically, it's going to be in the Miriam and Ira D. Wallach Orientation Center, which is on the fourth floor, kind of in amongst the other dinosaur exhibits. There's two others. There's the Ornithischian and the Saurischian, and then there's kind of this introduction hall area. And right now what it has is a juvenile barosaurus in the middle of the room, and it's not particularly big. I think I would guess maybe it's 20 or 30 feet long, and it's not a cast of fossils or real fossils. It's basically a reproduction of what a living one would look like, and all around it there's other information about different dinosaurs and other fossils that are in the museum. But what they're going to bring in is a 122-foot-long cast of a Titanosaurus, which is possibly the biggest dinosaur ever. It's definitely in the largest group that we know of, of titanosaurs. And to compare the museum's giant blue whale that they have hanging in the Ocean Life Hall is 94 feet long compared to this 122 feet long. And the T-Rex is only about 39 feet long, which is the one people spend most of their time looking at now. Maybe that'll change. But only about 40% of the titanosaurus bones have been found. That did include the all-important femur that helps them estimate the size and weight of the dinosaur. In order to fit the titanosaur in that orientation center, they're going to have to take out the juvenile barosaur that's been there since 1996. But even with taking that out, the new titanosaurus is barely going to fit in the room. It's not a particularly big room, for a museum at least. <laughs> Apparently its back is going to be up against the 19-foot-tall ceiling, and its head and neck are going to come out through the entryway doors. That is going to be a sight to see. Yeah, there's actually a 15-second video the museum released that shows a digital rendering of the display, and you can see its head poking out of the room. <laughs> That's really funny. We mentioned that there's only 40% of the titanosaur that's been discovered so far. So for the other 60% of the bones, scientists will be 3D printing the bones and then coating them in resin or fiberglass, painting them and doing everything they can to make them match with the other bones. And the benefit to that is that those bones are going to be fairly light, especially compared to solid rock ones they're usually dealing with. So it'll be easier to get them on display. They estimate that it'll take about a week to assemble all the bones. We're not sure when exactly it's going to go on display yet, but once it is, we'll be sure to let you know. 
And just to mention really quickly something we talked about in last week's news, this is about the juvenile allosaur skeleton that's going to be going on auction. Brian Switek, who is well known for writing about dinosaurs, wrote a piece on The Guardian speaking out against the upcoming auction, arguing that it should go to paleontologists who can properly study the skeleton. I'm sure this is a big debate that goes on between people who want to own skeletons privately and for their own private collections and then museums or researchers. So it's just interesting to think about for this particular case. We've got an update on The Cube, Queensland University of Technology's interactive learning display. The team will bring five Australian dinosaurs to life, including Banjo, the Australovenator, and the herbivore Mutaburosaurus. Sean Druitt, the Cube studio manager said Banjo would have been, quote, a cross between a cassowary, a Komodo dragon, and the African wild dog. The Cube will open to the public in December, complete with 10 dinosaur species, quote, separated into front and back paddocks by a virtual fence. Should be entertaining, and if we ever make it to Australia, we will definitely have to go and see it. Next, the IG winners have been announced, and for those of you who don't know, and I just learned this, the Improbably Research Group from Harvard hosts the IG Nobel Prize every year. This is a play on the word Nobel and ignoble, which means not honorable in character or purpose. And this year's biology prize went to Chicken Plus Toilet Plunger Equals Dinosaur, based on a paper published in PLOS One whose abstract reads, quote, Our results support the hypothesis that gradual changes in the location of the center of mass resulted in more crouched hind limb postures and a shift from hip-driven to knee-driven limb movements through theropod evolution, end quote. And there is a picture that goes with this that basically shows a toilet plunger on a chicken tail. Actually, it would be a toilet plunger creating a chicken tail, since chickens don't have tails. But that, I guess, simulates the weight that a dinosaur tail would have on a chicken. And then, you know, the chicken dealing with that added weight by trying to crouch down, not fall over, probably has to lean forward. Also in the news, more of The Good Dinosaur, Pixar released a new trailer, and this one actually has dialogue. Interestingly, it's an international trailer, so it has Spanish voiceover and bumpers, but the actors' voices are in English. And from the trailer, we learn Arlo, the sauropod, gets separated from his family due to some kind of storm and is taken under the wing of a trio of T-Rexes. We'll post a link on our blog so you can see for yourself, and I know we're looking forward to the movie coming out in theaters on November 25th. Last in the news, the New Albany class, an invitational Grand Prix and Family Day in New Albany, Ohio, is known for having lots of entertainment in addition to its equestrian show. And this year which was Sunday, September 20th. It featured a collection of animatronic dinosaurs that were part of the first three Jurassic Park movies, specifically three T-Rex busts, a bust of Brachiosaurus, a bust of Spinosaurus, several complete Velociraptors, a baby Stegosaurus, and a newly hatched T-Rex. And these pieces were sold to private collectors after the films were made, and now a company called the Scare Factory stores and preserves them. That's super cool. Maybe one day we can own a piece of... Jurassic Park or Jurassic World. <laughs> and now for our interview with Christopher Lohman, a fourth year grad student at UC Berkeley studying archaeology. And Christopher requested the dinosaur of the day today, Pachyrhinosaurus. And in our interview, we discussed how he got to be part of an excavation of Pachyrhinosaurus with the Royal Tyrell Museum in Canada. Thank you, Christopher, for joining us today. Thank you. So you're an archaeology student, but have you ever... Well, first, let's talk about what's the difference between archaeology and paleontology. Well, I get asked if I dig up dinosaurs more often than if I get asked, do I dig up ancient people? Actually, I do neither. Archaeologists work on material remains from the past, but it's not necessarily even the ancient past. I focus on things from only 300 years ago in my research, but I still think dinosaurs are cool. Have you ever considered going into paleontology? Yes, absolutely. It was what got me into the mindset of thinking of the past as something that was very material, something that we could find just by going out and looking for it. I wanted to be a paleontologist from when I was three until I was a teenager. 
What changed? I went on a paleontology date <laughs> and realized that it wasn't just dinosaurs. It was actually with the Royal Tyrell in the summer programs they do for kids. I was 10, and I'd been told when I was three and I first got interested in dinosaurs that I could go on a dig someday, and my parents looked it up and found that 10 was usually the age that they let kids go out and help for a day or two. So I reminded them every birthday that I was one year closer to being able to go on a dinosaur dig. And they found a wonderful program at the Royal Tyrell. And when I visited the museum, it was on a road trip with my dad. We went all across the country and up to Canada to where the Royal Tyrell is in Alberta. And spent a few days going out to the dig and helping build apply plaster and use brushes things that a little kid could do. But we visited Dinosaur National Monument. We went to museums in Montana. It was kind of a dinosaur road trip with my dad, which was pretty cool. But at the Royal Tyrell, at the time, and I think it's still there, there was an exhibit on the Burgess Shale on Cambrian creatures that I'd never heard of before. And that actually got me thinking, Am I interested in just dinosaurs, or am I interested in anything that it's possible to go out and find in an excavation? And so I started rethinking, and I loved history, so eventually I switched to archaeology. Do you have a particular focus in archaeology? I do. I do historical archaeology, so things from about 300 years ago and more recently. I'm really interested in immigration, the movement of people around the world, and the things that they brought with them. I'm also interested in museum anthropology and studying the objects that we have already in museums, but discovering more about them. And my love for museums absolutely comes out of wanting to be a paleontologist when I was a kid and spending hours and hours at the Academy of Sciences when they used to have all the different dinosaur displays and going to other museums, like I said, with my mom and dad. So since you're a Berkeley student, have you made it to Cal Day when they open up more of their dinosaur? <laughs> I have, absolutely. We always do a, an archaeology section on Cal Day for kids, which is really fun. But afterwards, I've gotten to explore the campus and go over to the Valley Life Science Building and... I love that anytime you go in, you can see the Parasaurolophus skull and the model T-Rex, and that's really cool. But being able to go back and, and look at the fossils that they have was great. Yeah, we gotta go. <laughs> yeah. We need to go. We haven't made it yet. But one of these days. One of these years. <laughs> Do you know, how did your parents find out about this program at the Royal Tyrell Museum? That's a good question. We didn't have the internet at the time that they looked it up, which is funny because that's how I would look it up. I'm not sure, actually. They were always really good at fostering whatever I was interested in at the time. And I went through all kinds of phases, but dinosaurs really stuck around. So we had videotapes and audio tapes and books and anything dinosaur. The thing that first got me interested was when a friend of the family brought back some plastic dinosaurs from the Natural History Museum in London, and that kind of sparked my interest along with things like the dinosaur scene in Fantasia, or I don't know, did either of you ever listen to the audio tapes of Dinosaur World or Lost in Dinosaur World? No, I haven't heard that. What is that? They were a series of short books that were always accompanied by audiobooks with sound effects and actors and things that pretended that there was a zoo of dinosaurs and what it would be like for kids or families to go and visit the dinosaurs. This was before Jurassic Park, and it's a much tamer idea of what would result from a theme park with live dinosaurs. Mostly they just go and watch, although they get into a few scrapes. But I loved the idea. And actually, in that book, in the audiobook, at the very beginning, 
one of the characters is of Escape to Dinosaur World. One of the characters is tuning into a radio station called W Dino, and the announcement at the beginning sounds just like the announcement at the beginning of your podcast. <laughs> w Dino, and so I thought maybe you got inspired by that. <laughs> No, but that's awesome that there's a connection. Mm -hmm. We're going to have to check that out. (laughs) So you requested that we cover Pachyrhinosaurus. Is that your favorite dinosaur, or what's your connection? The Pachyrhinosaurus I'd never heard of before going to the Royal Tyrell, and it was the dinosaur that was being excavated when my dad and I went out with the paleontologists and got to help out. So it was the first dinosaur that I'd ever seen in a fossil bed being excavated. And so because I got to help out on it, I got to learn more about a dinosaur. And it's particularly weird. It's a really strange-looking dinosaur. It doesn't fit the kind of dreamlike familiarity that you get with Tyrannosaurus rex or Triceratops. It just looks bizarre and alien, and I love that it was so different from what I expected. Can you tell us a little bit, like, did you get to help out with the dig at all, or was it more watching? What was day-to-day life like at this camp? We got to help out. We only went out to the dig a couple times. I was 10, and it was the Badlands. Digging through solid rock is tough. And I remember having to drink a lot of water and eat a lot of chips in order to get through the day. We were down next to the fossils. We were given brushes, toothbrushes, and we were cleaning them, which to a 10 year old seemed really cool, actually. And I know now, since we do the same thing in archaeology, that even that is really helpful. That it's not just a pretend task for a kid, that they really are helping on the day. The program that I remember doing, we went out for most of a day and then went back for a second day. Looking through the website today, I don't see something that matches up with my memory. But then again, I was 10. But I do see that they have dig days when families can go out kids go out and do the same thing that I remember for part of the day. Part of the program was also being given tours of the museum and being able to meet paleontologists, and that was a very memorable part, too. Not only seeing the museum, but being told how the museum was put together and a bit of the history, what the exhibits meant. Do you remember which paleontologists you got to meet? No, I don't. I just thought they were cool and they had hats and bandanas. Nice. So would you recommend this camp to kids who are interested in dinosaurs? Absolutely. The Royal Tyrell is the best dinosaur museum that I've been to. And the fact that they offer camps and they offer courses and all kinds of things is really great a way to not just imagine being able to be involved with paleontology, but really being able to reach out and get involved. Is that where the Dino 101 course was through? No, that's the University of Alberta. But it's the same guy, curator. Uh, so Dr. Phil Curry, I don't know if you're familiar with the paleontologist. Yep. Yeah, he worked at the Royal Colorado. He does this free online class called Dino 101. It's really awesome. I heard about it through podcasts. <laughs> now I'm interested. It's pretty fun. Yeah, I think it runs usually around January. So, you know, sign up. So. I'll look it up. Yeah. Do you think you'd ever go again to a, a Royal Tunnel dig or one of these kinds of programs? Well, I usually go on digs myself during the summer, but they're, of course, archaeology digs rather than paleontology digs. The skill set is significantly different enough that I'm not sure that I would go again for any other reason than to have fun, or if I have a kid someday, then to bring my kid to do it, because that I would absolutely do. In paleontology, so much of it is an intersection with geology, whereas for my particular area in archaeology, because I'm dealing with 
objects that have survived for reasons other than turning into rock. I don't have to pay as much attention to the chemistry of geology, the sedimentary layers, and rather I'm just thinking about different deposits in the ground and how the objects fit into those deposits. So theoretically, it's similar, but methodologically, it requires a very different set of knowledge. So I don't think that I would get involved in a paleontology dig professionally, since at this point, I don't have the skill set. But I would definitely go back to that kind of program if I was accompanied by a kid. Interesting. So where do you go digging for archaeology? Anywhere. I've worked in Turkey, in England, in Hawaii, and the British Virgin Islands, and in California, actually, here in San Francisco. Most of those digs, I'm helping other people out, so other graduate students in my program or professors from when I was an undergrad. So those aren't my own digs, but rather digs that I've been able to participate in. Was all that stuff around that time period you're interested in? So you're not really digging in rock and stuff like that? It's more like dirt? We were digging in a combination of dirt. Sometimes it was sand. Sometimes it was mud. And actually, they're from all different time periods. Turkey was a 9,000-year-old city. But we were digging through essentially dried mud. In England, I was working on a Roman fort and a Viking town up in York. Here in California, that's the time period that I'm most interested in, Gold Rush era and more recently. But depending on the kind of soil you're digging through, preservation can be really different. In San Francisco, bay mud is anoxic, so it doesn't let oxygen in, which causes material to decay. And so without oxygen, you can pull out material that looks as if it were very dirty, but buried just a few days ago. Yeah, it's really cool. Do you have any advice for younger people who might be interested in paleontology or archaeology, something along those lines? Like I said earlier, I was really lucky because my parents supported my interests and did so by finding books and movies and programs like the one at the Royal Tyrell for me to be involved in. And that's absolutely led to my career now. Obviously not the same career, but very influenced by it. So I would say if you're interested in something, if you're interested in dinosaurs, if you're interested in something else, then kids go for it. But parents figure out ways that, if it's possible, support that interest and see where it goes. It can make a big difference. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Pleasure talking to you. Pleasure talking to you, too. Thanks again, Christopher, for speaking with us. And now for the dinosaur of the day, Pachyrhinosaurus. Pachyrhinosaurus' name means thick-nosed lizard. It lived in the Cretaceous in North America. It was discovered by Charles M. Sternberg in Alberta, Canada in 1946, and the species was named in 1950. Sternberg also named Edmontia. He was a reverend son, and his sons George, Charles, and Levi also hunted for fossils. So it became a family business or hobby. The first Pachyrhinosaurus fossils may have been discovered, actually, in 1880, but it was the ones found in 1946 that led to it being named in 1950. Partial skulls and other fossils have been found in Alberta and Alaska, and different species, but not many fossils were available to be studied until the 1980s. Technically, Pachyrhinosaurus is a horned dinosaur, but it didn't really have horns. Its skulls had flattened bosses instead of horns, with a large one over the nose and a smaller one over the eyes, and bosses are big, flattened bulges. An adult Pachyrhinosaurus had thick sheaths and padding to cover their nasal bosses. They also had a pair of horns from the frill that grew upwards and small ornamental horns on the skull. This varied between species, though, and individuals, and there's three species, but I'll get into that in a minute. In the 1970s, some paleontologists thought that the bosses on a Pachyrhinosaurus' face were just the base for giant horns that may have broken off after they died, but so far no giant horns have been found. In 2013, PLOS One published a study called An Immature Pachyrhinosaurus 
Peritorum Dinosauria ceratopsidae nasal reveals unexpected complexity of craniofacial ontogeny and integument in Pachyrhinosaurus. And they found a new juvenile specimen of Pachyrhinosaurus peritorum, one of the species, in Alaska that showed the changing stages of the nasal boss, quote, reveals a more complicated craniofacial ontogeny in Pachyrhinosaurus than previously thought. At one point, the two nasal bones were fully fused together, and the nasal posterior may have quickly elongated to accommodate this nasal boss formation. Pachyrhinosaurus had bones on its head, possibly used for headbutting, either to find mates or just to fight each other. Specimens have been found with broken ribs and partially healed ribs, so they may have flanked each other. And they may have charged their predators like a modern rhinoceros. Again, three species have been found. Pachyrhinosaurus lacustae from the Wapiti Formation about 73.5 to 72.5 million years ago. Pachyrhinosaurus canadensis from the Lower Horseshoe Canyon Formations about 71.5 to 71 million years ago. Pachyrhinosaurus paratorum from the Prince Creek Formation in Alaska about 70 to 69 million years ago. Pachyrhinosaurus canadensis was named in 1950, Pachyrhinosaurus lacustae in 2008, and Pachyrhinosaurus paratorum in 2012. The type species is, as you may guess, Pachyrhinosaurus canadensis. In 2008, Philip Curry, Wan Langston Jr., and Darren Tank made a detailed monograph of the skull of a Pachyrhinosaurus and classified it as a second species, Pachyrhinosaurus lacustae, named after the person who discovered it. A Pachyrhinosaurus bone bed was excavated in Alberta in the late 1980s, where paleontologists found 3,500 bones and 14 skulls. Possibly there's a group that tried and failed to cross a river during a flood. The fossils were from juveniles and adults, so that shows that they may have taken care of their young. It was Al Lacusta who found the bone bed in 1973, which is why they named the species after him. And he was a science teacher from Alberta. The Pachyrhinosaurus bones found in this bone bed had convex curved outward and concave curved inward bosses, possibly due to erosion. The Pachyrhinosaurus paratorum species is named after Ross Perot, and this is because he funded scientific expeditions. The boss on the nose was different for each species. Pachyrhinosaurus canadensis had eye and snout bosses nearly together, with curved backwards pointing horns on the frill, two flattened horns that point forwards and down from the top of the frill, and a flat round nasal boss. Pachyrhinosaurus lacustae sometimes has been found with two curved backwards pointing horns on the frill, and it had a jagged comb extension on the tip of the nasal boss, a pommel on the front of the nasal boss, and a comb-like horn rising from the middle of the frill behind the eyes. Pachyrhinosaurus paratorum had eye and snout bosses almost together, a jagged comb extension on the tip of the nasal boss, and a narrow dome in the center of the upper portion of the nasal boss. Interestingly, Pachyrhinosaurus canadensis and Pachyrhinosaurus lacustae had two small curved horns that pointed backwards and came from the frill. Pachyrhinosaurus peritorum did not have this, and actually not all Pachyrhinosaurus lacustae had them, so this may have changed based on age or gender. Also, some Pachyrhinosaurus lacustae frills had unicorn horns, but that may just be the way that the fossils were preserved. These are the ones found in the bone bed. In 2014, Darla Zielinski from the University of Calgary announced the find of a well-preserved Pachyrhinosaurus skull, 75 to 80% complete, found in Alberta's Badlands. The skull is an adult, and it's large, possibly the biggest Pachyrhinosaurus skull discovered. They found the skull in October 2013, but it took a few months to remove the five tons of rock to get it out. This may be a new species, or it may be part of the three existing ones. The skull is six and a half to eight feet, two to two and a half meters long, and the animal was six meters long, so this means it was very top heavy. The largest Pachyrhinosaurus species was about 26 feet or eight meters long and weighed about four tons. Pachyrhinosaurus lived near other dinosaurs, including ceratopsians like Montana ceratops, a hadrosaur, Edmontosaurus regalius, theropods including Sauroornitholestes and Trudon, also possibly the Tyrannosaurid Albertosaurus. There were also mostly hadrosaurs in the area. Pachyrhinosaurus had a short tail, 
about 18 to 23 feet, or 5.5 to 7 meters long. It may have been fast, reaching speeds of up to 20 miles an hour. It had a small primitive hearing apparatus, so it's probably not very good at hearing. And it also had reduced olfactory centers, so it probably had a poor sense of smell. It also had poor vision, based on a study of its brain cavity finding a not very well-developed optic center. It was an herbivore with strong cheek teeth, so at least it had that going for it, and it ate fibrous plants. It replaced its teeth regularly. There was a beak at the front of its snout, so it probably cropped vegetation, and it probably ate cycads and palms. It may have even eaten newly evolved flowering plants. It may have also migrated to warmer climates following coastal plains, or maybe they stayed in the same area. It's not clear why they're found in both Alberta and Alaska. Their fossils have often been found near Edmontosaurus, so maybe they traveled together. They may have reached maturity at around nine years old, based on Gregory Erickson and Patrick Druckenmiller's study of Pachyrhinosaurus femurs, and they probably only lived to about 19 or 20 years old. Pachyrhinosaurus was the official mascot of the 2010 Arctic Winter Games because a bone bed was near the Grand Prairie, Alberta, and this is a competition for athletes in the north. Pachyrhinosaurus was also the star of Walking with Dinosaurs, the movie, in 2013, featuring Patchy and his brother Scowler in their herd. And Pachyrhinosaurus was also in Disney's Dinosaur in 2000, which was an awful lot like Land Before Time, just more modern graphics. Not as funny. Yeah. Plus, <laughs> no little foot, so I can't say it's as good. <laughs> Pachyrhinosaurus was also in the History Channel TV show Jurassic Fight Club. And the Philip J. Curry Museum opened up in the beginning of September, and in addition to watching documentaries and looking at lifelike skeletons, visitors can actually build a Pachyrhinosaurus with magnets on the wall. Pachyrhinosaurus is part of the clad Pachyrostra, which is part of the tribe Pachyrhinosaurini, which is part of the family Ceratopsidae, which is part of the clad Marginocephalia. Marginocephalia means fringed heads, and it includes pachycephalosaurs and horned ceratopsians. They're all herbivores with the bony ridge or frill at the back of the skull. They lived in the Jurassic and Cretaceous. Ceratopsidae were quadrupedal herbivores from the Cretaceous, with most living in North America and some in Asia. They had beaks, rows of shearing teeth, and horns and grills. And their subfamilies are Chasmosaurinae or Centrosaurinae, and Pachyrhinosaurinae is a subfamily of Centrosaurinae. And our fun fact of the day comes from Alaska, just like the first news story. The Prince Creek Formation, where the most recent hadrosaur was discovered, in northern Alaska preserves one of the most diverse and prolific assemblages of polar dinosaurs that's known anywhere in the world. And that's because at this point there are at least 13 different dinosaurian taxa that are known to that area, including five ornithischians, seven non-avian theropods, and one avialan theropod. And that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. If you get a chance, please visit our Patreon page at patreon.com slash I Know Dino, Patreon spelled P-A-T-R-E-O-N. Thanks for listening, and until next time. Thank you for listening to I Know Dino. If you have any questions or comments about dinosaurs, we'd like to hear from you at plesiosaur at iknowdino.com. And for more information on dinosaurs, go to iknowdino.com or follow us on Google, Facebook, Tumblr, or Twitter at iknowdino.